Yeah, I hear being a lineman is a good job, just as a side parenthetical. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to sign up for that. <laughs> so is that where the um, the three-story unit is in the back of the parking, Correct. or where was that line? That was in the back over that over the parking area. Okay, so you paid seven thousand dollars to move that, and then yep. you talked about having to do some some structural retrofit and mm -hmm. to the building. Did you have that cost factored in, or was that another uh, no. sort of like oh that man? That was that was a surprise too. Um, it the framing number I based off of basically I'm 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 used to budgeting on larger projects. This is a surprise, and when you have a larger project, you're able to. Um, sort of defer these costs over more units. So a 27 unit project, a water meter for instance, I didn't realize I'd have to buy a new water meter, but mine was a, um, a three quarter inch. I needed a one inch because of the fire service. So I ended up paying, I think it was in the neighborhood of $20,000 for a water meter and water credit units, et cetera. Um, and that was a surprise. So when you divide that over four units, $5,000 a unit, it adds up really quickly. But if you oh, divide man. over 27, it's nominal. Yeah, so yeah, no, like that that $20,000 hickey, that's, yeah. Yeah, so I was definitely way over budget, but I think the product turned out pretty nice in the end. Okay. Now, how did that affect the loan? Did you have any contingency built into the loan? What would you recommend to other architects do that want to go this route in terms of um, the amount of loan they should take out? Um, I was... I was beyond my loan. I was able to use my credit cards to sort of float things um, in the process, which was, I, I mean, that's one of the biggest things I recommend. And plus, I have enough frequent flyer miles to fly around the world twice now. But um, make sure your credit line on your credit cards is big enough because that buys you an extra 60 days. Um, and, it's, and I paid them off every month. Um, so it, it's fantastic. It's basically free money for 30 days and then really 60 days because you're able to put out the, uh, the bill another 30 um, so credit cards are fantastic. What else? Um, well, speaking on the credit cards, while you think of what else, um, oh, how does that work? Who, who pays it off? Uh, where does the money come from to pay off the credit cards? Well, I had, um, in the, the, uh, investment from those two investors and my own money, I had a fluff there of, I think around a hundred thousand dollars that I, I would draw out of, um, and that, that would get me to the next bank draw. So I really basically pushed all my overages to the very last minute, and um, I, I had to take out one more loan at the end because I, I had to pay people off, but um, because that period was short between um, when I was anticipating to get my permanent financing, I ended up selling, but when I was anticipating to get my permanent financing, I had a uh, one to two month period with another loan of it was seventy thousand um, dollars roughly at 10%. So it was a nominal fee to actually carry all those people and get all my subs paid. Okay. So that loan was to, was that because you were over budget to make up the difference? Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. And then what did, what did that, what did that loan look like? Was that a personal loan for, um, for yeah, yourself? Yeah, I borrowed or? from my, my parents and my sister. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. I probably could have went back to my investors and asked for more money, but um, I didn't want to scare them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, there's some serious love in that family. There's a lot of love. Probably too much. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted their interest immediately after, though, let me tell you. <laughs> they Did they get the bookies on you? Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> nice. So, and what'd you offer them? You said 10%? Same, same exact terms that I had my other investors. 10%, okay. I mean, so I during... probably could have called other people if I needed to, but it was just, I need the money quick, so. Okay. Now, what, what lessons did you learn from building the project? Um, you, you really need to be there the whole time. I was working for my dad probably four to six hours a day and at my job four to eight hours a day um, and vice versa. And I was burning myself out and I wasn't catching things that I should have been catching. So I definitely recommend either you somehow are financially um, solvent enough to be able to be there full time or really understand that you're going to be diminishing your capability to catch things at one or the other job. Okay. And when you say catch things, what kind of things were worrisome to you that you found? You know, missing hold downs, missing fire caulking, things like that. Um, uh, one of the bedrooms was framed wrong, um, and I should have caught that. It just, yeah. I, the immediate after they framed it, um, I walked in there, oh, this is, this is way off. This, this 
wall should have been a foot and a half in the other direction. But um, I was able to sort of adapt it and make it work because it would have been a ton of work for them to take it out. And that's sort of the relationship you develop. They take care of you and you take care of them. So in those instances, I didn't make the frame remove the wall. That would have probably been two days worth of work. Okay. But All right. So be there as much as you can. Yeah. What other what other insights can you share about about building a project? Um, you know, I I just think walking it at least twice a day, really understanding what you're doing because you can. In, in my position, I was able to change things just as my dad taught me. So as the building was progressing, I was changing things. I noticed that one of the walls wasn't um, designed correctly by the engineer, or, or it was correct, but it, it had too much deflection. Um, so I had I paid an extra thousand or fifteen hundred dollars to the framer to put a post and a beam across it so that um, this two-story wall in the back unit wasn't flexing almost an inch. Wow. So was that the the um, stucco portion finished on that or that was actually the metal, so it wouldn't have mattered too much, but drywall probably would have been cracking on the inside. Okay. Okay. Now tell me about the finish that you used and the sort of window wall systems. Um, what did you find out? Did you find any good deals on stuff or do anything creative there? Yeah, so it, it's interesting. When you start to look at the cost of everything, um, a window wall or a storefront system probably costs, at least in San Diego, in the neighborhood of 16 to $22 a square foot. Um, stucco is probably 4 to $6 a square foot, maybe closer to 7 when you include the plywood that we typically put underneath it. Um, and you start to have these cost-benefit analysis where you say, okay, well, maybe it's better if I, I eliminate the, the stucco there and put a window in instead or, or things like that. And it doesn't, sometimes you realize that the cost to change some of these things is so nominal and the benefit's so great um, that it's, it's a simple decision. Nice. So you might say, okay, it might be $5,000 more to stick in a, a window wall system here. Shoot, it's going to add to the space. Correct. Or in the front of the building, um, the post office used to have this four-foot wall that ran across with a uh, storefront above it. And I was standing there. I happened to have a bobcat on the site that day. And my stock cutter guy was there that day, too. It's just coincidence. All the stars aligned. And my window guy came up and he said, you know, it would be easier for me if you just knocked that wall out and I ran floor-to-ceiling glass. I said, great. What's it going to cost? Nothing. It'll save me a ton of time. I said, perfect. Got the bobcat, drove over. My saw cutter saw cut the left side, pulled the wall out, dumped it in my trailer. My guys took it to the dump and the window wall went floor to ceiling. Huge difference in the space too. Awesome. So originally that was just going to be a partial window? Correct. Because it's you probably had that... a six foot window instead of a 10 foot window. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It's incredible. And that's the kind of decision we can make without having to call the client, call the architect, call the contractor, um, and make some change order to necessitate that. Yeah. Uh, I just literally hopped in the Bobcat, bulldozed the wall, and he installed the window 10 minutes later. Nice. Now, I know you were thinking about living in the project originally. Yeah, so to did, actually Did you ever an, do that? No, I never actually did. Um, to get an FHA loan, you have to actually be uh, an occupant on the property. Um, so that was my intention in the event that I was going to get an FHA loan, but I didn't. So I ended up selling the property because I couldn't get the FHA loan, and I couldn't okay. get a conventional loan either. Tell us about the closeout process then. Tell us about what happened there when the project was finishing up and your exit. Uh, yeah, so basically the project's value based on an income stream, which is uh, uh, rental income, was far greater than any comparables in the neighborhood. So a building, my building, that should be worth somewhere between 1.5 and 1.7 million based on the incredible rents that I got, um, was actually appraised at a million and a million one. Um, so that really hurt me on the takeout loan. Basically, it, was, it wasn't feasible to get a takeout loan because my cost was exceeded that. Wow. Um, so let me, let me pause you there for a second. What were the comparable rents in that area that they were the, looking at? The rents were similar, but because it was a one to four unit project, they don't base it on rents. They base it only on comparables. Oh, okay, so actual sales of other buildings. It's a residential loan instead of a commercial loan at that point. So if okay. you're four units, if you're five units and greater, um, it's a commercial loan, and they'll base it, they'll base it on a, com a combination of comparables and income stream, but primarily income stream. 
Okay, and on the flip side with your project, they based it strictly on neighborhood comparables. Okay, and how many other buildings that basically had sold in the past year or two? Probably the past uh, year. Basically, nothing that was getting those rents that I was getting. They're all um, sort of like duplex houses, et cetera, in the neighborhood. So um, there was nothing with the kind of spatial qualities of my building. Okay, incredible. So your that that appraisal came in. It was it was less probably than the money you wanted to you needed to get out of the project to pay off your investors and close. Yeah, the deal. it was less than the cost of the project. Wow. Okay, so, so you're, a, you're you're faced with this. What do you do? Uh, I was pretty frustrated, um, and my only real option was either to take on a partner and have him put cash down in the deal, um, or to sell the building. So. I ended up selling the building. Um, I made out well, uh, really well. Um, the buyer made out really well too, and um, it was a quick close. It was a thirty-day close. Um, okay. And I was so, literally just about to go to market when this person called me and told me they were interested in buying it. Nice. Okay. Tell me about the timeline when you decided. Okay, we got this appraisal back. It's way too low. We can't do this. I want to sell the building. You know, what are the next steps that you're taking? to get that building on the market, what are you doing? Um, I actually, I didn't interview, but I contacted four brokers in San Diego that I felt were um, adequately capable of selling the project. And um, What made them capable in your eyes? They know the neighborhood, they understand the product type, um, and they have a history of selling buildings, um, sorry, and in addition, they have a history of selling buildings of similar type, but just a, a feeling in it. There's a lot of sleazy brokers out there, and fortunately, in the past few years, we found some incredible brokers that are really good people and genuinely care about their clients and their um, buyers and sellers. Okay, so you 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 identified these four brokers, mm -hmm. called them up, asked them, told them about the project. Yep, and, and I sort of asked them what their feeling was, what the what do they think the value was. Here's the rents. Um, and they all told me it was going to be difficult to sell because there's no comparables in neighborhoods. So it would have to be almost a cash, 100% cash buyer, which I ended up selling to. Um, and they developed sort of a, a faux market package. Hey, this is what our feeling is. And I, I called all these people, I think, on a Monday. I told them I needed to know by Friday. But by Wednesday, I'd actually already pick somebody. Nice. Um, so assuming that person hadn't come through to purchase the building, uh, you're you're talking to these guys. Did they come back with any sort of prices that they thought they would want to list it at? Yeah, I think it was actually going to be listed at a million five seventy five. Okay, and was that were you comfortable with that? Yeah, no, I was very comfortable with that. I my goal was to get somewhere in the million five neighborhood, um, and I ended up selling it for a million four seventy five as a concession um, because I the buyers are fantastic people. Um, We've actually purchased property from them in the past, and they were going to keep the building forever. So, I wanted to go somebody that actually cared, rather than a a large um, apartment company or or something like that. And these people really do care. They love the product, and I honestly don't think they'd ever sell the building. Okay, so you're getting ready to sell the building. Tell me how this person contacted you. How they know about the project? Where this where this came from? The the purchaser that came in there. How that happened? Um, coincidentally, I think. I think my dad had met with him the night before to talk about some other projects and it just came up in conversation um, that this uh, family friend of ours dad needed to place money um, he had X dollars and needed to put it somewhere and and my dad said oh well, you should buy the post office and he said that's a great idea get Matthew to send me everything I'll take a look at it tonight um, and he did and then he called me the next day he's like we need to make this happen so it was just progressing from there. How did how did they feel about the price you're asking for the project? Um, they, he actually is a, a, um, a big time developer, works for Trammell Crow, so he gets it, um, which was fantastic. Uh, he, he actually offered, I think, a million five twenty five, a million five fifty, I can't remember, and then I, as again, as a concession, brought it down to a million four seventy five. Uh, when they got their appraisal, which also came in extremely low, the dad was having some, some heartburn and some, um, some skeptics of what was actually going to be happening. Okay, so 
Okay, so the dad whose the money was coming from was just having some misgivings when he saw the low appraisal come in. Yeah. It's, whoa, why am I paying, you know, $400,000 more than the appraisal? Mm. So, uh, the million four seventy five sounded a lot better to him than a million five twenty five. Okay. And who made the call to, um, to the father to explain that and sort of sell him on the deal? His son. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, the value of relationships, right? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, that's, I think, is there anything we left out about the fancy lofts, Matthew, about your experience developing that project? No, um, I, I haven't done it yet, but um, I think it's also important for, for architects to learn how to use a camera and photograph their work. Uh, it's not that hard anymore, and that's something I haven't had time to do, but um, I'm hopefully going to be doing it the next week or two. Awesome. You know, I've seen some of your work on Jonathan Siegel's website, I believe. Is that is that some of your work on there? Yeah, I pretty much photograph everything for our company now, or his company, excuse me. Awesome. Well, as a, as a little parting gift, can you give us um, a couple of photography tips for do-it-yourselfers out there? Um, make sure you understand how to make a building parallel in the frame. Uh, it's really important. A lot of people don't understand that. It's a very simple process, um, but I think that's the most important architectural tip that I can give you. When you say parallel, you mean up and down, that it's not looking like Correct. it's Correct, it's not distorted in or out. Yeah, yeah. And do you have, I know they have special, I forget what they call the special um, lenses to do that. Is that how you do it or how do you make it happen? No, you know, I do it, um, I use a program called Lightroom. Adobe makes it. It's very affordable and um, very simple to use. But a, a tilt shift lens is there you go. typically expensive. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay. Well, Matthew, I look forward to um, to introducing this project, having all the, the feedback, having our listeners see the project, see what you did there, and look forward to the future. What's what's next for you? You know, now you have, you exited the, the project, you made some money? Yeah. Okay. And what's next? I'm looking for property. It's all too expensive right now. So uh, I keep checking LoopNet, hoping that something comes up, but we'll see. Okay. Excellent. Well, I hope when you, when you find that new project and you move on to that, you You'll come back on the show, and we'd love to tell everyone what you're doing and how that project's going. Definitely, and a great show, too. Really appreciate it. Good. Matthew, it's been great having you. Take care, Enoch. Okay, thanks. You, too. Bye-bye. Well, that puts the lid on another show about the business of architecture. I really hope that you got something out of this show that can help you have more success and profit in the world of architecture. And if you want to join the discussion about this episode, you can find it on the podcast page on businessofarchitecture.com. And while you're there, feel free to share the show using the social media share links. If you sign up for the Business of Architecture Insider List, I'll send you other resources like the Architect Marketing Guide and information on how to use web tools to get more visibility for your firm and your work. expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts and I make no representation guarantee promise agreement affirmation pledge warranty contract bond commitment except to help architects conquer the world bump music credit to Ben Folds 5 do it anyway